You know, people talk about the importance of first impressions, and my next guest made a big one this past Saturday at UFC Vegas 19. She stopped Shauna Dobson in the second round of her UFC debut. King Casey O'Neill joins us, fresh off her victory. How are you, Casey? I'm good. Never been better, so feeling real good after that fight. I would say so. Congratulations on the win. It's been less than 48 hours since the fight happened as we record right now. Has it like sunk in what you just accomplished on Saturday night? Um, I don't think so, you know. So obviously, like, I don't know if people talk about this, but like your first UFC fight, I, nobody told me before it, but you don't realize how sort of blacked out you become, you know. So like, I think instincts took over from the fight and I don't even really remember the fight that much to be honest so I'm still sort of like piecing it back together in my head and it's sinking in slowly but yeah is this just is this like the first time that's happened to you or has that happened at other points in your career never so yeah this is the first time that I sort of like I went out there and I was standing in the cage and I felt like cold and like nervous and I never feel nervous and I was like oh god and then um, maybe two minutes in, I started to feel a bit more like myself. But I don't really remember anything. I remember, like, bits and pieces that's coming back to me. But, yeah. Do you remember the actual, like, walk to the octagon itself? I remember it, but it's sort of like an outer body experience, if you understand what I mean, you know? Like, it was, I guess I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. You, I've waited, like, a long time to make that walk and obviously... It was my dream for a long time, and then it was happening, so it was very surreal. Did it sort of live up to the expectations that you set for that walk? Because, you know, it's it's different for, you know, a 23-year-old who's 5-0 and making that walk compared to, like, a 16-5 and fighter who's in their 30s. So, like, obviously you weren't doing it in front of a crowd. I know you're very close to your parents. You wanted to share that moment with them, and they weren't there. Was it a little weird making the walk in front of, like, very few people and not having your parents in the crowd? Yeah, it was an experience for sure. Like, um, I guess that I had sort of always envisioned making that walk like in front of a big crowd in Australia or something like that, you know. So that's how I'd always imagined it going. But obviously with COVID, there's not many people there. So I kind of like knew what to expect, and, but then didn't in a way. Um, I would have liked to have had a crowd there because I feel like I would have been able to show my personality more. I was sort of a little bit like uh, reserved because there was nobody there to sort of be boisterous for. So I didn't get to show like much of my personality, unfortunately, but I guess there's always next time. There you go. A lot of it, what's interesting about you is like a lot of 23 year olds who aren't even like and you're a professional fighter. It's not easy to be a professional fighter for a number of reasons, but a lot of 23 year olds who aren't as traveled as you are. They struggle to, to, to like make ends meet and, and put things together. You go from Scotland to Australia, to Thailand, to Vegas, all different places to like build this big network around you. And you're doing it essentially by yourself. Were there a lot of days where things were kind of getting rough on you during this sort of rise? Like maybe the bank account was dwindling. There's a pandemic going on, shutting down events around the world. Were there like a fair amount of struggles along the way to get to this point? Yeah, I mean, I would say probably the past three years straight has been a struggle. So uh, obviously, like you said, moving around a lot and just making it work for myself. And Thailand's a relatively cheap com country, which is something that helped me. And uh, obviously winning the scholarship with Tiger Muay Thai, they helped me out a lot financially as well. But definitely once I got to Vegas, I wasn't already signed when I got to Vegas I was uh, still trying to get signed so that was a shock to the bank account for sure as soon as I got to America and had to start paying regular prices for things again I was like you need to make this happen like now get yourself there because you're running out of money and thankfully I did a couple weeks later I ended up signed and uh, I made it work yeah it's got to make you feel like you know the sacrifices you made the struggles you've had they paid off for you. I mean, you got to, you had to have felt pretty good. The timing was probably perfect for you. Yeah. I mean, I'm a strong believer in everything happening when it's meant to happen. So, uh, I never stressed the fact that it hadn't happened for me yet, uh, per se, but obviously I was starting to get 
stressful in a way because I was like, well, then maybe you need to find another fight, you need to fight for someone else, you need to make some money, or you maybe need to go somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I've always been able to make it work for myself, so I think I strive in uncomfortable situations, especially like being young and moving around by yourself, you really have to learn how to sort of depend on yourself. So no matter what, when the bank account was running low or the motivation was running low, I can always like pull myself out of it and uh, make something happen. Life experience is a, uh, it's a lot. You bank that life experience and the fights get a little bit easier. So before the fight happens, Chaz Skelly and Jamal Emmers were supposed to get after it. And Chaz Skelly's in the octagon and we find out that Jamal Emmers has back spasm b- backstage and he's not going to be able to fight. So what was happening when you found out that, hey, you're going to head out there a little earlier than you anticipated? Yeah, so that was so weird. For like That's obviously a first time in the UFC that's ever happened. But for me, even that was like so strange. So they come out the back and they tell me that one opponent's in the octagon and one's not going to make the walk or it looks like they're not going to make the walk. So I could be up in 20 or I could be up in 10. So just be ready. So uh, the pressure of my first UFC fight and then added pressure of, oh my God, I'm like, am I walking now? Am I walking then? And then that's like starting to like make me nervous, I guess. And yeah, then eventually his opponent didn't make the walk. So they're like five minutes uh, and we had to go and, Yeah, luckily I was already warm. Actually, like, that wasn't the first weird thing of the night. So that other fight fell off, the Luis Pena fight. And that was meant to be in between me and my teammate who had the same corner, Juliana Rosa. So uh, my, uh, my team found out about that. And they're running between the change rooms to warm both of us up at the same time. So... So, yeah, it was all it was all a bit up in the air and everything was a bit crazy and you know, for my first experience I think that all the craziness sort of just added to it and it ended up being even better after I won because everything was done and relaxed. What's what's more taxing on you, the anticipation for the fight or the fight itself? Because like putting pen to paper on a fight in like November, no, for for a fight like in February, you know, you're in the UFC, but the fight isn't for like another three or four months. Does the anticipation levels, like just getting to the fight, sort of exceed the actual fight itself for you? Yeah, a hundred percent. So I'm a real mental fighter and I'm a chronic overtrainer. Any coach that I've ever had in my life will tell you that. So I found out about the fight in November and I put myself in fight camp straight away. I was like dieting and training three times a day and everything. So the body was getting broken down and the mind was like racing, obviously wanting to make a good first impression of my first UFC fight was my biggest goal. So knowing for about the fight for as long as it, I did was almost detrimental. So uh, yeah, the fight itself is always the easiest part for me. Every fight that I've had, it's sort of like once I'm in there, I know that like I can mix it up and I'll be okay no matter what happens. But getting there, I'm very in my head. And like I said, I manifest a lot of stuff and I uh, meditate like try and make things happen in my mind before they happen so I'm always I spend a lot of time in my head so knowing about the fight for a long time and it meaning so much to me definitely took its toll and that was the main relief after the fight not even the win like the fact that the first one was done was the the main relief so when they come in and they tell you hey you're fighting early you're probably like let's go let's get I this was, team rolling. I was happy I was like Yes, 10 minutes is good, actually, because 20 minutes, my heart might explode. (laughs) The fight was, uh, it started off the way I expected it to. You and Shauna just exchanged big shots early. She's a very aggressive starter anyways, which is something I'm sure you were prepared for. When she hit you the first time, did it feel like any difference to your pre-UFC fights, or is that like the wake-up call you needed? Definitely the wake-up call I needed. I had obviously watched tape of her and I knew she started hard and aggressive so I was like I'm gonna start more hard and more aggressive and that's sort of what happened there like it was like a little like tumbleweed of us two at the first like 10 seconds and when she hit me like the first thing that went through my head was like fuck yeah oh sorry I'm not <laughs> okay. but I was like We're- yeah let's go like I'm awake now I'm moving my head and that like sort of woke me up for sure. I was a bit stuck in the mud, but I ate that one and my head came back and I was like, I'm ready to go. <laughs> there you go. And by the way, you could say whatever you want here. This is the okay. internet. The internet's a beautiful place. Okay. Uh, 
So you get you get you get your takedown. You get to side control. She was able to get up, but you spent the rest of the round controlling her. You negated her. You know everything she tried to do. You had an answer for it. How confident were you feeling heading to the stool after the first round? Because something tells me like you weren't overly thrilled with a lot of that round. Like you were winning a lot of it, but something tells me you weren't. I guess completely satisfied with the first five minutes of that fight. Yeah, so like I said, mental fighter, very big perfectionist. I'm not happy with the whole fight, to be honest. Um, I feel like I rushed a lot. Like I said, I came out hard and aggressive to try and match her, and then I sort of never slowed it down on the ground the way I usually do. I I let her uh, reverse position too many times and stand up too many times um, for my own liking. So I'm standing in the corner between the first and the second. I'm like, you get her down and she doesn't get back up. Like, that was the only thing that I was thinking in my head. And my coaches had the same idea. You know, Coach Casey, who's my grappling coach, he's like, slow it down, position, then damage. So I think I did a better job of that in the second round. The first round, I just sort of went balls to the wall and, uh, you know, was moving around like crazy. And second round, I slowed it down and just tried to damage her. Yeah, you had her in all kinds of trouble, mounted her, elbows, punches, just landing over and over again. Finally, Chris Tyone steps in and stops the fight. What is going through your mind when the fight is stopped and that first win is is in the books? Yeah, like that was probably the best moment of my life so far, you know. I couldn't hold back the emotions. I cried on live TV, which I didn't want to do, but it just happened. Um yeah, it was relief. It was like shock almost, you know. Like I said, I was blacked out for a lot of the fight. So, like, I sort of came back to and was like, oh, my God, I just did it. Um, and, yeah, just thrill and uh, disappointment that my family wasn't there, I guess, a little bit as well. But there was a lot of emotions uh, rushing through me at that point. Did, did they watch it live? I'm sure they did. But did you get a chance to talk to them, maybe, like, FaceTime them after the fight? What was that conversation like? Yeah, I called them both. My mum was a blubbering mess the way she always is, <laughs> just crying and, like, losing her shit. And my dad was, like, obviously super stoked. So, uh, like, my mum is probably my biggest supporter, but my dad has wanted this for me as much as I want it for myself. Like, since I started fighting, he made a lot of sacrifices before I could drive. He used to drive me 45 minutes to the gym from where we lived, Uh pretty much every night and if he didn't drive me there he drove me home after I got three trains myself to go there you know when I was too young to drive so uh it meant a lot for for them as well to see me like to do this you know especially moving away from them a couple years ago that was a big decision for me like you said I'm super close to them so it was like a big hard decision to move away and I, I knew that it was the best step for my career at the time and uh Obviously, they miss me a lot when I'm not there. So them seeing that it finally paid off and that I made it happen for myself, they were just like very proud of me. That's great. I know. I know you're black. You were like blacked out for most of the fight, but like the final stretch, you're landing these shots, and Chris Tyone is warning you about the back of the head. And I, I know, like you're you're in these moments, like you're not trying to punch anybody in the back of the head, obviously. But when you have like one person on offense, like you're at, the other person trying to desperately get out of this bad position. Sometimes the movements between the two of you just don't always intertwine the right way. So, again, you're kind of blacked out. I don't even know if you remember the stretch of the fight. But when he's warning you about the back of the head, does that like throw you off your rhythm at all? Like especially on the mental side of things, because you don't want to lose a point in your first UFC fight, right? Yeah, so I do remember that part, and I do remember thinking when he was like, what's the back of the head? I was like, well, she keeps moving her head. Like, it's not my fault. Um, I remember thinking that, but it does throw you off your game. That was, like, the first time I've ever been warned about hitting someone in the back of the head. So I was, like, obviously landing shots, and he'd be like, watch the back of the head, and you'd almost, like, take a second to, like, adjust and be like, try not to hit the back of the head. So that gave her an extra couple of seconds, I think, uh, because when I was on the back at that first bit and I was landing the elbows, I was like, I was very blacked out at that point. Like I was just <laughs> going for it. And then he's like, what's the back of the head? And I'm like, where? Where's the back of the head? So, yeah. Did you did you watch any of the earlier fights before you fought? Um, yeah, I watched 
the, I think it was the second one, the knockout, Eamon Zahabi, whilst I was in the back, and then I sort of was warming up for the rest of them. But that's the only one I caught. Okay, so you, so you didn't see the Sergey Spivak fight earlier on? No, I didn't. I didn't watch that fight. So Chris, Chris Tyone was the referee for that fight as well. And listen, I, I will say this, Chris Tyone and any referee, that is a difficult job. That is why I'm not a referee because I don't need that headache. I don't need that. Very few times you get praise as a referee, but when you make a mistake, man, oh man, the people are all over you in the Spivak fight. Chris Tyone just let Spivak just punish poor Jared Vandera for like, 30 shots too many and people were just screaming for this fight to stop. It seems like your fight with Shauna, we're, we were getting to that line. Like it could have been stopped a little bit sooner. What did you think of the stoppage? I mean, I liked that it went a little bit longer cause I like hitting people. So I got a little bit more time to hit her, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like my one was good timing to be honest. I've watched back the fight a couple times and a couple of the strikes that I was throwing because uh, I was in such a high mind, she had her elbows up and I was just smashing elbow to elbow. So I think he could see that and he definitely stopped it at a good time though because I wasn't, she wasn't moving like once I got to that mount in the second round. Um, but I'll have to watch back the other fight to decide what I think on that. Yeah, you'll, yeah, I think you'll agree with me on the other fight. Was it weird watching it back? Like seeing yourself in the octagon? Yeah, so weird. Like uh, I've watched it maybe three times now and even just like, it still doesn't feel real that I did that, like, you know, so I think that it's going to take a couple. I've got, a, like, quite a few friends who were already in the UFC, and they were telling me, they were, like, warning me a little bit about the fact that the first four sort of are, like, out-of-body experiences. You need to get that, like, uh, get your feet wet, I guess, before you can, like, jump in and have a swim. So I'm excited to get the, the next couple out of the way so I can start remembering the fights. To share that moment with with Ty Gwerder, and those watching right now, he's he's a Bellator middleweight, uh, very promising prospect. He's in your corner. What was that like for you to, to kind of share that big moment in your life with him? It was cool, you know. So, like, obviously, we were together for the whole fight camp, and he knows how much it meant to me and everything. So uh, to have him there, like, and see me, like, actually do what I said I was going to do, I think that it was pretty cool for both of us. Um, and now it's my turn to go and do the same for him. So I'm excited to be on that side of things because I think it's more nerve-wracking. Like, I think my one was more nerve-wracking for him, and I'm pretty sure his will be more nerve-wracking for me. But, yeah, it was cool to have that moment together. As you uh, probably have gotten in pretty much every post-fight interview you've ever had, we only let you soak up these wins for, for so long, Casey. It's on to the next one. What do we want next? And it didn't look like you took a lot of damage in the fight. When do you want to come back and, and keep this train rolling? Yeah, so I called my manager about 20 minutes after the fight and was trying to book another fight. So uh, hopefully we're going to like aim for the first couple of weeks of May or the end of April. So that's no, I don't want to wait any longer than me. So Mick knows that too. I've made sure that he knows that. So we're getting back as fast as possible. My main goal this year is to have three or four fights and make a name for myself. So I started chapter one, but uh, I got a, a long way to go and I'm only just getting started. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that because, I mean, when you look at like the development of your career and you, you're in the very capable hands of Mr. Danny Rubenstein, one of the best in the game. He's He's been with people who are in the pos position you're in right now. I assume you have very lofty goals, becoming a world champion, but is getting to that point something you want to get to as quickly as possible, or are you just kind of buckled in, ready to enjoy this ride, enjoy this development? Because like you said, you're only 23, you're 6-0 and as a pro, you're not even near your athletic prime yet. Yeah, I'm not in a hurry to fight for the belt. Like I've spoke about it, a lot. Um, I want to fight everyone in the division. I just want to fight all the time. So uh, being 23, I think that once you end up becoming the champion, you're almost like one or two fights a year at most because it's a lot harder to fight when you're the champion. But being a contender, you get to fight as many times as possible. So I'm looking to to just fight as many times as I possibly can for a little while. And if that title shot comes around, obviously we won't say no, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy with a slow burn. So when you saw some of the, like Kevin Holland last year fighting five times and going five and oh, you're like, that's what I want. Something like that. Yeah. I've mentioned it in other interviews that that's sort of like 
what I want to do, the same thing, you know. So just stay busy and make sure that the UFC knows that I'm always an option to fight so uh, they know to call me when they need someone to jump in. I'm sure you don't care who's on the other side of the contract, but I do have to ask, is there anybody that you kind of have your sights set on? Anybody sort of stick out to you for the uh, the sophomore appearance? No, I mean, not anybody per name, like name per se, but uh, definitely since I fought Shannon, and she already had four fights in the UFC. I don't want to like fight a newcomer or anything. I, I want to keep fighting people that have been in the UFC as well and test myself against like better and better competition i think that's one of the most important things to me is to fight somebody better each time that i fight so that i can uh try and improve myself uh fighting somebody who's tough is the biggest motivation for me in fight camp as well to train harder and like become better good enough to beat them so yeah by the way were you uh were you bummed you didn't get a bonus or did you kind of understand oh. it i mean you're <laughs> so bummed i was like come on uh, i like talked about the fact i was running out of money guys you could give me a little <laughs> help <again. laughs> but, yeah. i mean there's some stiff competition there it was once i started seeing the amount of finishes on the card i kind of knew that i was like oh i guess i'm not getting one but uh hey like Derek lewis is getting paid like three hundred thousand. i'm getting paid a lot less than that you could be giving me that 50k i could use it yeah, I mean that that knockout was brutal. Like a lot of times I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah, that was a rough one. But even Julian Arosa, like flying knees, I know the stoppage was kind of questionable. There were uh you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. The best part is so obviously we're teammates and uh I called, like I said, I called my fight. I was going to finish in the second round. I'd been speaking about it cuz I had that dream a couple of times the night before. And then actually that night, Julian was like, I'm just going to skip me and get the fuck out of there. So like <laughs> he called his own fight too. I just thought that was so cool that we had like this little uh, psychic bubble going on, obviously, because both of us called our finishes. So that was awesome. Well, I mean, but the, the resurgence that guy is having, it's just, it's, it's inspiring. It really is. I mean, the third stint in the UFC, he's finally got, the, and he's like, he's not just beating like fighters in the, he's beating like really good guys. Like Sean Woodson's no joke. Nate Landwehr's no joke. And he goes in there and, and gets two big finishes. How inspiring is that being around somebody like Julian, who's been there, done that. And is finally starting to put it together in this third trip to the UFC. Yeah. I'm super stoked for him, you know? So he's obviously not had a super easy run, but he works so hard. He's in the gym so much, you know, like training and you can see it in the gym, how good he is like the way he trains and like the way he handles people in the gym. And now he's finally like put it together in the big stage and obviously on a two fight win streak. And I think that he's just going to continue to do bigger and bigger things. And he's in, he's massive for his weight division. So that also is something that people have got to look out for, you know, his reach and his legs on the ground and his jujitsu. So yeah, he's, he's going big places. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good night for uh, Extreme Couture. Casey, congratulations on the win! What a debut! And I got to thank you because you made me look like I knew what I was talking about throughout the week. I kept piping you up, and and you delivered in a big way. So it's always nice when that happens. Outstanding stuff. Can't wait for the next one. And uh, all the best to you. Enjoy the win. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you after. Thank you.